Welcome to Reporter's Notebook, where we talk to the Washington Examiner's top journalists about the stories breaking on their beats. I'm Jim Antle. I'm joined today by defense reporter Mike Brest. Mike, the Biden administration is under pressure to deal with the problem of Americans who are wrongfully detained abroad. Talk a little bit about what that's looked like and what some of the concerns people have been raising are. So it's important to remember that the Biden administration got Trevor Reed home within right. the last two weeks. Right. Trevor Reed was wrongfully detained in Russia for just under three years. It mm -hmm. was roughly 980 days, his family has said. Mm -hmm. uh, he was detained there in the summer of uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. He got released in a prisoner exchange that the Biden administration in Russia agreed to. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, he's now in Texas receiving treatment at a at a military base sure and his family has been very happy to get him back mm -hmm. uh, but it also has brought renewed attention to all of the Americans who the US believes is wrongfully detained overseas mm -hmm. right now that number stands at 59 mm -hmm. a number of family members of those people who are detained abroad came to DC this week uh, and they held a rally outside the White House and this was the first time for a lot of these families that they all came together for a singular event, uh, and that was to get the administration's attention. Mm -hmm. uh, there were families of people who are detained in Russia, sure. uh, in Iran, mm -hmm. in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And so all of these families had the same message, which was, we need the administration's assurances that they're doing everything that they can mm -hmm. to get our loved ones back. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's been sort of a a narrative that prisoner exchanges are politically toxic. Sure. And when you talk to these families, uh, all, a lot of them point to Trevor Reed, mm -hmm. and they say, look at the the broad bipartisan support that the president got for making that deal for Reed's return. Right. Uh, make that same deal for our loved ones. Sure. Uh, Elizabeth Whelan is the brother of Paul Whelan, who was, or who is being detained in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, she has spoken with Jake Sullivan and Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, in the past couple days, uh, and her message is to not leave her brother behind. Sure. Uh, she felt, and her she and her brother David and their parents uh, had a lot of conflicting emotions with Trevor's return because, uh, to them in their mind, all of the prisoners held in Russia together uh, would be released at the same time. That mm -hmm. was their their belief, their hope. Mm -hmm. And so when they found out that Trevor was coming home uh, and Paul wasn't, they had a lot of conflicting emotions, they said. And so moving forward, uh, all of these families, you know, wanted the attention, they wanted the spotlight uh, that the Reeds got because mm -hmm. the Reeds, you know, they stood outside, President Biden's motorcade got his attention. Right. They had a phone call, they came to D.C., stood outside the White House, mm -hmm. and then got a rally, or got a meeting with the president. Mm -hmm. And so all of these families want those same accommodations. They want to feel heard, mm -hmm. uh, and they want the administration to do whatever it takes to get their loved ones back. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a problem in that you have fewer concessions you can make after you've traded this prisoner for Trevor Reed, so it becomes a concern for Paul Whelan and his family. Absolutely. And the other thing to consider is these, these Americans who are wrongfully detained are not being treated well. They're not in right. good conditions. Right. Uh, one of the impetuses administration officials have said behind Trevor's release was his failing health. Mm -hmm. His family said he's had COVID, right. uh, he, had he was suffering from tuberculosis, right. uh, he'd been in and out of the hospital but wasn't receiving the best care, they said. Sure. So with his health deteriorating, the administration felt like it was prudent for his life mm -hmm. to get him back. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say uh, anything about the treatment that the other prisoners uh, who are wrongfully detained overseas uh, are going through. Uh, but one interesting thing is in addition to all of this that's going on, uh, President Biden met earlier this week with the family of Austin Tice, sure. who uh, is being detained in Syria. He's been there for roughly 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's this push by the Biden administration to make these families feel heard mm -hmm. uh, and to let them know that they are working these back channels to hopefully get their loved ones home. Uh, and a lot of these families actually spoke supportingly of the administration's recent decision to label Brittany Griner the basketball star uh, as being wrongfully detained in Russia. Right. So she was arrested in February uh, for alleged drug possession. Sure. Uh, as, a, as an athlete, she also plays in Russia, so she was mm -hmm. going there to play for the season right. and was arrested in the airport on this these drug charges. Right. Now, uh, she's still being detained. She, or she will have a hearing uh, later this month. Mm -hmm. But so this designation allows a different entity within the State Department to sort of handle her case. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these families mentioned that it took a lot longer 
uh, in their loved one's uh, detainment to get this status mm -hmm. as being wrongfully detained. So in a lot of people's eyes, they see this as the administration correcting uh, their strategy in this regard. Mm -hmm. So another thing President Biden did was he visited a Lockheed Martin facility in Alabama that's been pretty instrumental to our military aid to Ukraine as they try to defend themselves against the Russian invasion. That's right. Earlier this week, Biden visited uh, the Lockheed Martin facility in Alabama, which is known for their Javelin missiles. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest... And these are anti-tank yes. missiles. Mm -hmm. So these are missiles that can be fired from people on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, they can travel for up to, I believe, two and a half miles, and they can take out tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take out even planes. And so uh, these weapons are provided, are becoming crucial because the terrain in the area of Ukraine that they're fighting in now is very flat. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the U.S. is really deplenishing its stockpile uh, to give Ukraine these weapons, and they're hoping that these, co these companies can re resupply them. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're seeing some, some issues along the lines. Uh, we heard within the last couple of weeks the Raytheon CEO, uh, who also Raytheon contributes parts uh, to these javelins as well as making their own weaponry, uh, say that some of these parts and some of these uh, weapons won't be ready for you know a year right because of the difficulty of the of the manufacturing process so the US is providing all of these weapons now mm -hmm. but they aren't going below their personal minimum stockpile requirements right but they are getting to the point where they are looking for you know some long-term solutions as well as long-term planning for how to continue to arm Ukraine if it's necessary in the long term. Mm -hmm. So the president also used this visit to sort of highlight his request for supplemental for more money from Congress for Ukraine. Exactly. So uh, the Biden administration has uh, provided the Ukrainian military with about four billion dollars, slightly under, uh, of military aid uh, mm -hmm. in the roughly 10 weeks since Russia invaded Ukraine in the end of February. President Biden, recognizing that these drawdown packages wouldn't be sufficient in the long term, uh, requested Congress authorize $33 billion in funding to Ukraine. Now, all of that wouldn't be for the military. Right. Uh, a lot of it would be for humanitarian aid, sure. uh, provide, making sure that they have food, right. uh, you know, hospital supplies because hospitals have been targeted. Right. And so uh, roughly $20 billion of this 33 package would go to defense spending. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Biden has called for Congress to pass this. A lot of Congress has uh, s said they plan on it, uh, but it hasn't happened yet and it could happen in the next couple weeks. So now one of the reasons why there was such a big push for more military aid to Ukraine is that the Russian offensive has changed and there was some hope that they would get assistance before Russia altered its tactics and started hitting a different part of the country in the next wave of their invasion. But even though things were maybe a little bit more delayed than the Ukrainian government would have preferred, Russians are still having some trouble over there. That's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, from the Pentagon uh, to the UK Defense Ministry, we're hearing that Russia, even in the Donbass, which is their sort of their backup planet, so to speak, right. they aren't having success there. Mm -hmm. We're hearing that they're having the same logistical issues, they're having low morale mm -hmm. uh, within their units. And these are issues that we've heard about for weeks now. We heard about it uh, pretty much from the jump, uh, whether it was uh, faulty supply lines and not being able to get uh, new supplies to the troops at the head of the, uh, you know, at the head of the convoy. Sure. And mm -hmm. so a lot of these problems uh, are things that they haven't quite figured out yet. Now they figured out some of these issues and they're also now in a much more condensed space so it's easier for them to resupply. But we're hearing from the Pentagon that they still aren't making much progress. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see because Ukraine, uh, in addition to fending off and saving their capital, they're now holding on to the Donbass, which is a region that, you know, should have favored the Russians as they were expected to be favored throughout this entire military operation. But that really hasn't come to fruition. Now, a concern whenever the Russian military offensive is stalled, now, obviously it's, it's good news for Ukraine that they're not making progress, but the concern then becomes, are they going to become more brutal in places where they do hold territory, and are they going to commu uh, commit more human rights abuses? Exactly. It's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And so we saw this in Kyiv. Mm -hmm. And so the Russian military came down from Belarus, which borders Ukraine to the north, 
uh, and they made it to within about 10 to 15 miles of Kiev, the capital, which was their intent. Uh, but once they hit that, they hit that sort of marker, they couldn't get any further. They hunkered down in defensive stances, mm -hmm. uh, and eventually they retreated. Mm -hmm. And upon that retreat, uh, as Ukrainians sort of tr uh, started to figure out the damage, uh, both the human and the infrastructural tolls that had been taken, sure. they, un they discovered uh, horrible and horrific uh, alleged war crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, we've heard uh, mass graves with hundreds of bodies. We've heard about civilians being uh, tied with their hands behind their back and executed. Uh, we've heard about uh, rape. We've heard about you know sexual violence towards minors. We've heard horrible things that have been attributed uh, and believed to be done by the Russian military. Uh, the Ukrainian pro uh, general prosecutor, uh, prosecutor general, uh, mm -hmm. said earlier this week that her office alone has opened 9,600 cases into alleged war crimes being committed in the last 10 weeks, and she expects the number to get even higher in the coming days and weeks. Mm -hmm. And so her office is inundated with these with these uh, you know, allegations that they're going through individually one at a time. Uh, and something that she said earlier this week that stuck out is they identified t 10 soldiers who they believe to be responsible for war crimes, and then they, a couple of days later, announced there was an 11th one. And this 11th uh, Russian soldier uh, has been accused of killing four civilians and torturing others. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way she described uh, sort of this discovery was that it was a drop in the ocean, was how she phrased it. Mm -hmm. And so the phrase really sort of demonstrates the gravity of what her office is trying to deal with at this moment. And it's going to be a lengthy investigation, it's just really the beginning. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. You can read Mike and the rest of our national security team's coverage at WashingtonExaminer.com.